And right before we get the video started, I want to tell you guys about this new app that I just found called Real Cappers. It's a pretty interesting app. If you go to the Google Play Store, you go to App Store, you could find it. And uh, basically what they're doing is they're trying to find some of the best handicappers for UFC. And I think they're going to branch over and do other sports as well. And you could go over there and you could find all the predictions from great cappers, elite cappers, all in one spot. So you could see where people are leaning in terms of a certain fight, the percentages. And uh, if you click further and uh, look in, you could sort of see the certain people that are going to be giving the predictions. And right now they're still growing their base and they're trying to uh, get more cappers and things like that to join on. But it's a very interesting thing because you could go in there, you can kind of look and you could see where a group of really good cappers are kind of putting the fight uh, percentage wise, at least in terms of their prediction. And you can look at the odds and you can kind of see if you can find an edge that way. So it's a it's a very interesting thing. I think it's something that is uh, potentially going to pop off. So definitely check it out. It's uh, on the App Store, Real Capper. So go download the app. I would really appreciate if you guys downloaded it and uh, put your picks in or not or just checked out the picks that are on the app and got the information. And I think you could really learn something from it and uh, it could help you out. So Real Cappers, check it out and uh, – Think you're gonna have some fun on the yo. App. What's up, guys? We're back for another breakdown of predictions video, and this week we got a pretty good card, an interesting card with Grant Dawson taking on Bobby Green in the main event. Two guys that well known by fans. I feel like obviously Bobby Green is the veteran that they're trying to build a name for Grant Dawson off of, so it's gonna be kind of the battle in that fight, but. Interesting card all around and definitely excited to break it down. We're coming off a really good Dana White Contender Series last night where we hit a plus 1,500. We hit two underdogs with the two Brazilian fighters and went four for four on the prediction. So that was uh, really awesome. It was the best Contender Series performance that we've had this year. Hopefully we're going to bring that momentum into this week. And like I was saying on that video, there's a ton of MMA going on this week, man. There's Octagon MMA. There's Bellator 300, which has ton of fights, has some high-level fights, has title fights, there's um, LFA, there's a few other events, and I definitely am going to be getting into breaking all that down and looking into quite a few fights. I already have some bets for UFC, quite a few bets, and I'm feeling pretty confident on this card. I feel like I got a good read on some props that are mispriced that we're going to be able to take advantage of, and I also believe that uh, Bellator 300 and a couple other of these smaller shows, even the LFA or the uh, one fight night show potentially could have some value in certain positions as well. So definitely going to be looking to take advantage from some spots this week betting. And uh, you know where to go when um, when you want to get some of the best bets in the world for MMA. That's patreon.com slash MMA prediction guru. So I really appreciate everyone that goes over there, checks it out, helps build the channel and it helps you guys make some money. And let's try to get a lot of likes on this video, man. Share this video if you can. I was a little bit disappointed with the uh, views on my uh, Contender Series video. I know I was gone for a week, but damn, man. I mean, hopefully you guys come back. I definitely want to get at least a 1,000 views on every video, so that was a little bit disappointing. But um, yeah, man, I uh, feel like I deserve um, you know, some more um, respect in that in terms of views. So hopefully we can get this uh, video up in terms of views. I would really appreciate that. Hit the like button, share it, and coming off some, giving off some really good information. So hopefully you guys could enjoy this video and um, we can get some more views on it. But let's get in this first fight of the night here. The first fight of the night with uh, JJ Aldridge and she's going to be taking on Montana De La Rosa. And this is a very interesting fight. We got Montana De La Rosa who's kind of coming in here on a skid where she has lost two fights in a row and she was originally going to fight a different opponent, too. She was going to fight Stephanie Egger, who is way different stylistically than J.J. Aldridge. So kind of a tough thing for her. And um, Aldridge, she just fought August 26th. So she's coming in on short notice, but she should be in pretty good shape. And she's a veteran. She's always going to be ready, kind of fight the same style. We know what we're going to get from her. And um, De La Rosa... Like I said, she's lost two in a row, and she only has one win in her last five fights. So, really has struggled, and she's been fighting really high-level competition, so it's hard to hold it too much against her. Whereas Aldridge, she's won four of her last six, but she's fought more low-level fighters. So, it's a good matchup to show who's going to get a top 15 opponent or kind of close to a top 15 opponent next, and who's going to end up 
probably being out of the UFC sooner than later and probably getting a bad matchup or a gatekeeper type of fight for their next fight. But Montana De La Rosa is definitely better than her record indicates. I mean, she's big for the weight. She could switch stand. She has improved her defense. And as a striker, she... Still a little bit stiff, but she's gotten better at finding her timing and landing crosses or overhands and using that to get the clinch. And she has all right kicks. In this fight, she's going to have to be aggressive and not stay at range where Aldridge is going to pick her apart if they do stick there. Her timing is good on her clinch entries, and that's what she's going to have to do. She's going to have to use her size, use her grittiness, use her kind of tenacity, get that clinch, use her head positioning, get the body lock. And she could take the back from standing, good back control. On top, she has good ground and pound. And she can win fights with ground and pound submissions. Um, She trains with team elevation. So her cardio is on point training in Colorado. And she hung tough with Macy Barber. She gave her a hard fight. Um, Macy Barber's a top five girl. And she's super tough. I mean, before her last fight, she had never been finished in the UFC. And being on a two-fight losing streak is never where you want to be. So... She is going to have a lot of pressure to get the win here. But J.J. Aldridge, long rangey southpaw. She brings that same style to the cage every fight. She's slick, good timing, good accuracy. She'll keep opponents at bay with their pot shotting jabs or one twos. And she can wrestle and grapple also. She has decent timing on her level changes. She can hit takedowns when she goes for them. I feel like she is an underrated grappler. She also has good takedown defense. She's hard to track down. She cuts angles well. Good at denying the clinch and keeping it where she wants it. Power for Aldridge isn't there, though. We haven't really seen girls that really respected her power. In certain fights, there have been fighters that walked through her shots, made it a dogfight. And Aldridge getting wood a little bit when she gets in some bad situations. She wants to be in a low-volume tag sort of fight where she's touching and moving and not getting hit very much. And when it gets ugly, sometimes she can fall apart. But she definitely has a striking advantage, though. And the grappling will be interesting because I think that Aldridge is underrated on the ground. She's good in the clinch, too. And even in her last fight, I mean, people are bagging on her for getting taken down. But she showed great technique, you know, using that butterfly guard to get back up to her feet really quick. And every time she gets taken down, she tends to get back up quickly. Cardio for Aldridge has never been an issue. Both these girls train in Colorado. Um, I feel like this fight could go either way. I agree with the line. I mean, I I think that now it's getting a little bit more on the De La Rosa like is coming out as a minus 150 now. So I'm going to go with Aldridge just because she's the underdog. Originally, she opened as a big favorite. And I think she's going to take a decision here. I think De La Rosa to win by sub is a sneaky bet. But if she can't finish the fight, I think Aldridge is going to be more effective on the feet. I think she's going to be able to hold her own in the wrestling and grappling clinch and win a decision. I mean, we've seen... Uh, De La Rosa lose decisions consistently at the UFC level and she's three and five in her career in decisions whereas Aldridge is nine and three in decisions in her career so if De La Rosa doesn't finish I think Aldridge edges it and I think JJ has shown that she's a great grappler a very good grappler in her own right I mean even in the fight with Aaron Blanchfield Blanchfield couldn't take her down I mean she took Blanchfield down multiple times And ended up getting submitted because of a mistake where she kind of slipped. So that's what she has to avoid. She has to avoid kind of that mental error where Montana capitalizes and snatches the neck and gets a front choke or something stupid. And uh, JJ loses the fight. But I don't think that De La Rosa is just going to go out there and just manhandle her and out-wrestle her and out-grapple her with ease. So I feel like Aldridge is going to edge it. And I'm going to go with JJ Aldridge via decision. And up next, we got a fight that's an interesting fight. I feel like the line's a little bit off on this one with Nate Maness. He's taking on Mateos Mundonsa. And it's um, a fight for where I do think Mateos should be the favorite, but I think the line's a little bit out of hand. I mean, I get it that Nate Maness, he has had some bad performances in the UFC, but he's fought quite a few times now at this point, and he's been fighting some really high-level competition. He's gotten some nice upset wins, and he has power, and that's something that could potentially be a factor in this fight. He is coming off two losses in a row and a layoff with uh, the Takiro Lembekov fight and the Umar fight. He didn't get the job done in those, but obviously got, those guys are some of the higher level fighters in the division. And um, we're going to see if Maness has learned from that or he's kind of at the end of his career. He is 32 years old. So 
if he loses this one, I think it could be his last fight in the UFC. So it's definitely a very important fight. And he's facing a hungry young guy that is looking to get their first UFC win. So obviously, that's not the greatest situation to be in, especially when you're facing a Brazilian guy from Shootbox, Diego Lima, with Charles Oliveira and all those beasts over there. So um, it's it's. I just feel like it's an interesting fight because... Mateos is a guy that athletically he has the advantage. I think he has the advantage technically striking. He throws more volume. He comes forward and kind of is an athletic striker where he likes to use his feet to get out of range, hands down, and will try to use his reflexes, head movement, and then slip and rip with straight punches. And he has some power. He has good kicks and uh, will throw these flying attacks. And then his grappling is on point. That's what he's going to be looking using this fight, get takedowns try to control Maness and Nate Maness though the guy's kind of tricky you know it seems like he's low volume he, he doesn't really do too much he has a hole in the wrestling and can get taken down but he's a dog in there I mean you have to put him out we saw in the Tony Gravely fight he survived a lot of adversity came back out the win and he has power and Mendonca leave himself very open to be hit I mean he can get clipped with big counters he likes to stay right in guys faces and uh if Mendes can connect with that right punch, we've seen him before put a couple people's lights out in the UFC. So I think there is a danger there for Mateos Mendonca that Nate Mendes is a guy that likes to hang around and then he could eventually land that kill shot, especially with Mateos. He does slow down sometimes. But with the layoff, with two losses in a row, banking on a knockout with a low-volume guy at 125 pounds, all of that to me is just not worth it. So I definitely feel like the younger guy in Mendoza that can mix it up, that has the ability to control where the fight takes place and is going to be the more active guy is the pick. So I'm going to pick Mendoza to get the win here. But uh, I just think it's a fight, probably a stay away fight because Nate Maness could play spoiler and get that knockout win. In this next fight, we got a fight at women's strawweight. Fight I'm not too interested in personally, but Kanako Murata, she's making a return to MMA after over two years away from competition. The last time we saw her was June of 2021, where she got her arm broken by Virna Janaroba, lost that fight. And I'm not sure the reason for the layoff um, being this long, but hopefully she comes back sharp, looks good. She actually trains with and cornered recently a fellow Japanese fighter that came back, Mizuki Inoue. And uh, Mizuki was able to beat Hannah Goldie. So Murata's looking to join her and kind of show that Japanese way maybe coming back to the UFC. And Vanessa Demopoulos, she has been an overachiever in my opinion. She came into the UFC late, started MMA late in general. And she had a three-fight UFC win streak before her last fight. She got that fight snapped. She had a big fight with a uh, former title challenger, a fan favorite in Karolina Kovalkiewicz. And pretty much got dominated for 15 minutes. But... In general, that was a bad week for Demopolis. She missed weight for that fight too. So it's going to be interesting to see how she looks in this one. She is 35 years old and she can't afford two losses in a row, especially if she struggles on the scales again for this fight. So it's a pretty pivotal fight for her. And she's the underdog, but it's kind of a familiar position for her. She's been the underdog in almost all her fights in the UFC, if not all of them, and has been able to get the win in a few of them. So... We're going to see. It is a decent matchup for her on paper because it is going to be a fight where she's going to get the type of fight she wants, right? I mean, you look at Kanako Murata. She's a former high-level wrestler. She wrestled on the uh, national team in her country and performed well at the world level. And in MMA, she's a beast wrestler. I mean, her wrestling is extremely impressive. And even on the feet, I feel like she's improving, but her striking is kind of... Her and Demopolis, if they strike, it'll be 50-50, kind of a low-level kind of trash striking fight. But um, it's going to be a grappling match because Murata, she's going to wrestle, and Demopolis does not defend takedown. She just flops to her back, and that's going to be the battle there. I mean, Murata, we've seen in fights, she's struggled with active guards. Like Emily Ducote gave her a lot of issues. She was throwing up a lot of submission attempts and ended up being a competitive fight because... Murata had a lot of top control, but she had to defend a lot of arm bars, and she eventually won that fight, but it was a competitive one, and Demopoulos um, could potentially pose similar issues to that, and then we saw Virna Janaroba, who was a higher-level grappler, 
end up, you know, sub- not submitting Murata, but breaking her arm or hurting her arm significantly and ending the fight through a submission attempt. So one thing about Murata, she's not going to be a part of the quick tap club. I mean, like I said, we just saw her last fight. She let her arm get messed up before it's happened out. And she's had other fights where she had really close calls and evaded the submission. So Demopolis is going to have to find that moment and submit her off her back. I think if she gets the win, but I think it's going to be a battle of that. If Murata can avoid getting submitted over 15 minutes, keeps that top position, can pass the guard and maybe do some damage or get in the crucifix or get into a dominant spot and rain some ground and pound, then she's probably going to get the job done pretty easy. But if Demopolis can keep it inside of her guard and keep throwing up submissions and making Murata work, maybe she could even win off her back or eventually find that submission. But for me personally... I never like betting on a girl that's path to victory or a guy or any fighter in general, really, that their path to victory is something, a guard sub from bottom. I just don't think that's usually a high likely avenue, especially at the UFC level. So I'm going to go with Murata in this one to get the job done via decision. But I think it could be, you know, a fairly competitive, interesting fight, especially if Murata is worried about the guard of Demopolis and decides to strike, then it could really go either way. But... I think uh, Murata's going to get the and win. This fight, kind of like the last one, I'm really not a big fan of this fight. Uh, Arichi Lang is taking on Johnny Munoz. Two guys that, in my opinion, are very untrustworthy fighters. Arichi Lang, he just got knocked out by Eamon Zahabi, who's kind of a harmless guy. He's never really shown crazy power in the first round, like really early in the fight. So that was kind of an alarming loss. And Johnny Munoz in his last fight, one of there against Daniel Santos and... I get that Daniel Santos is a beast. I think that he's potentially, you know, a top 15 fighter in the future. But Munoz wanted no part of that fight. I mean, he was pulling guard and really kind of just quit on himself in terms of getting the win and coasted to a decision, which was unfortunate to see. But how these guys match up, I mean, it's pretty clear it's a striker versus grappler matchup. I mean, you look at a Richie Lang and the guy is accurate. He's sharp with the straight punches and with the uppercuts. He has fairly good uh, accuracy, but he's low volume and he doesn't really have crazy power. He has decent power, but he doesn't have crazy knockout power. So being low volume isn't good. And Johnny Munoz, he is a guy that is really kicks on the outside that are not real powerful, but keep the range and stay active with the kicks and then use that to eventually find the takedown. His hands are kind of not very good in my opinion and when he can get it to the ground and make it a grappling fight he's really good on the ground good control he has a lot of submissions outside the UFC and he can grind it out he can push guys against the cage and hold him there and Arichi Lang he's shown okay takedown defense and okay ability to get back up to his feet but he did get taken down quite a few times by Cody Durden and Durden is a great wrestler but That was at 125. Munoz is a bigger guy. And he did get controlled quite a bit by Jay Perrin. He also got taken down in his uh, UFC debut, which led to him losing that fight in the third round. So he's had fights where he struggled defending takedowns and getting held against the cage. And I don't think he necessarily has crazy knockout power where I think he's going to touch Munoz at one point and finish him more than likely. And I... Don't think he's going to have crazy activity and volume either. So I feel like Munoz is going to find those opportunities to pin a Richie Lane against the cage, maybe get a takedown or two, backpack him, and win around that way. And I'm going to say Munoz takes a decision here just kind of through being the more aggressive guy and kind of implementing his game plan with the wrestling. Even if he's not super effective doing damage or anything, I think He'll get the job done. So I'm going to go with Munoz Vita. And for this next one, we're going to see if Karolina Kovalkiewicz is going to continue this career resurgence or if Deanna Belbita is going to kind of get this marquee win and move into a top 15 position for her next fight. So obviously the UFC is trying to build up Belbita and see if she's at the level to beat Kovalkiewicz. At this point, Kovalkiewicz, I feel like, is more of a tester for the UFC. She, in her last fight, took out Vanessa Demopoulos, who's on a three-fight winning streak that is sort of marketable, and I think if Demopoulos would have got the win over Kovalkiewicz, she would have been in a big fight for her fight after that one, and I think kind of the same principle holds here for Diana Belbita, and for Kovalkiewicz, 
not really sure what a win does for her. I mean, I, I don't necessarily see the UFC ever kind of putting her back into a position where she's going to be fighting a top five opponent unless she can win like three more fights in a row. So she's going to continue to probably get these sort of matchups and have to defend her position and show that she's still UFC level. So, uh, but when you're looking at this fight, it's going to be an interesting one. I mean, Carolina, she's won, obviously went to American Top Team for the win streak. And you could tell that she's won certain fights with different game plans. Like she took down Felice Herrick. She was able to take down Savannah Gomez Horas a couple times. And I feel like Diana Bobita is someone that Carolina should maybe try to implement a wrestling type of game plan against. Because I think if it's on the feet, I favor Bobita. I know that Carolina is a good striker and nice Muay Thai pressure. She throws a lot of volume, but she's always been very hittable. And I feel like Bobita is just a fresher version of Carolina and a little bit more technical. And she has a big reach advantage on the feet, which I think is going to be significant. And I think that Bobita's ability to attack the body is going to make Carolina struggle to get takedowns or be able to be effectively getting takedowns. And I think that also Bobita can land strikes at range. But Carolina is going to probably have a fairly significant clinch advantage. And she's going to have a big advantage if she can actually get it to the ground. So Bobita's just going to have to try to make it more of a war, make it more of a striking fight. And Carolina is going to have to implement her full game plan to get the win in this one. But I think it's going to be a war. And I just, I don't think Carolina's resurgence is, is real. I mean, maybe I'll be off on this one. I mean, maybe Bobita isn't quite as good as I'm thinking she is either and she could get exposed by having no clinch game no wrestling but I'm gonna lean towards Bobita I just think the younger girl in this one is gonna be able to keep it standing it's gonna be more of a striking fight Carolina in her fight with Silvana Gomez Juarez got two takedowns but that's the only fight that she's ever gotten more than one takedown in her UFC career so unless she could show that again in this one against Bobita I think Bobita's going to just be able to edge it on the feet. And I think as the fight goes on, she's going to put damage on Carolina and kind of pull away. So give me Bobita in this one to get the win. I'll say she wins via decision. But um, yeah, I feel like this fight is an interesting one. It's a good test to see where Bobita's at in her career and if she is the real deal or if she's kind of still needs a lot of time to and develop. And closing out the prelims, we got a light heavyweight fight that's going to be a really fun fight between two guys that go out there and go for the kill with Felipe Linz and Iwan Kutelaba. Well, I guess I'd say Iwan Kutelaba goes out there out there for the kill. Felipe Linz has a mixture of decision wins in there too. But I like Kutelaba in this fight. I see a lot of people on the fence. Or I've seen certain people lean towards Felipe Linz, but I got to disagree, man. I feel like this is a good fight for Kute Laba. You look at Felipe Linz, the guy is kind of a all-rounder, and he's a big guy for the weight. He has good cardio, and he has fairly fast hands on the inside. He could throw some punches and bunches, but I feel like he doesn't offer much on at range, and I feel like at distance, his hand speed isn't as good. Like He'll loop a lot of strikes. And he's very open to be hit. He has his hands down early, and I think Kude Laba is going to find that chin. I mean, Kude Laba is not necessarily the greatest striker, but he's improved, and we know he's extremely powerful, explosive, and close that distance. He's started to throw more straight shots, and he always has those hooks and overhands on the inside. And I just feel like his aggression is going to be a lot for Lynn to deal with. And Lynn likes to clinch guys, hold them against the cage, and use a mixture of clinch control and striking to win the fights. But I feel like Kute Laba is going to be the better grappler in a uh, clinch guy. I think he's going to be able to get it to the ground and control on top. And uh, I see him getting the finish in the first round, though. I think that Linz, a lot of his losses, he's got it knocked out. And I think Kute Laba is going to add to that knockout list for Felipe Linz in terms of knockout losses. I just think Linz is not going to be able to use kind of a stall against the cage and grind it out type of game plan in Kutalaba. I know other fighters have done it in the past, but I think that the guys that boot Kutalaba are really big guys that are super long a lot of the time or just extremely skilled higher level guys for the weight. And I don't see Felipe Linz on that caliber. So I think Kutalaba is going to dust him out of there in the first round. So give me Iwan Kutalaba to go out there and get the first round. And I like this next fight, Alexander Hernandez versus Bill Algio. We got Hernandez going back down to featherweight after 
He had his featherweight debut against Bilal Joe, lost that fight, went back up, fought Jim Miller on short notice, and now he's back down at 145 again. So it looks like he's going to have a go at this 145-pound division run here for him. And Bilal Joe, he's been up and down a little bit in the UFC, but currently he's on a nice little run. He's won two fights in a row, and this is going to be probably the biggest win to date if he can get it for his career. So it's a great matchup for both guys, and I don't really have a super technical breakdown for this fight because technically I feel like Hernandez is actually the better fighter everywhere. I think that he is more athletic. He's more powerful, the bigger guy. He has pretty good striking. He can close that distance with the straight crosses and uh, all right kicks as well. But I think Bilalgio just has that dog in him, man. And Bilalgio has the ability to create chaos in certain situations. He could get back up to his feet after getting taken down really, really well. He's very hard to control. He is extremely hard to finish. He's never been knocked out in his career. And I don't think Hernandez is going to go out there and be able to control him on the ground. And I don't know if he's going to try to wrestle because I feel like he's going to be worried about that gas tank. And I think he knows that Algeo is going to be difficult to hold down. So he's going to be forced to strike more, in my opinion, than he wants to. And I think early on, he has a chance to even potentially be the first guy to knock Aljo out, which I think it's unlikely with Aljo never being finished in his career. But Aljo is hittable. And the first round, I think he's going to be able to land on Aljo and have a lot of success, maybe even hit a takedown. But I just think when going gets tough, Aljo is going to get tougher and Hernandez is going to wilt, man. I just don't necessarily see... Uh, Hernandez being over the last 15 minutes, I think that Algio at some point is going to be able to turn the tides on him. And when the momentum starts to shift, I think Algio is going to take over the fight and get the finish, whether it's a TKO or a submission. So Bill Algio is going to be the pick for me. I just think that his grit and cardio are going to get the and job. And I don't really got a lot to say about this fight. Drew Dober versus Ricky Glenn. I feel like this is definitely a get right fight for Drew Dober. Ricky Glenn, he's a tough guy that he's had some great performances. Obviously, he went to a draw with Grant Dawson, beat the crap out of him in the third round and made him uh, make the decision to go to American Top Team. So Ricky Glenn may be the reason that Grant Dawson is in the main event right now on this card. But I feel like injuries, layoffs, a lot of that stuff has really hindered his career. I mean, his last fight, he went in there against Christos Yagos and looked horrible. I mean, he got knocked out in the first round against a guy that is an older vet that's not known for finishing people. Uh, I guess Yagos does have some power in the first round, but irregardless of that, it just wasn't a good look to go out there and get finished by a guy like Yagos early in a fight, especially when historically Ricky Glenn has been known for being the type of guy that could take a licking and keep on ticking and fight hard and be a real tough, gritty guy. Um, with Drew Dober, obviously, Dober got knocked out for the first time in a long time. First time in his UFC career in his last fight. And it was a bad knockout. I mean, it wasn't like a just a TKO. He got finished against Fervola pretty brutally. And I think the UFC likes Drew Dober. They know he brings the violence. They know he has a fan-friendly style and a lot of uh, support. So I think they want him to get in here and get the job done and get the victory. So they're giving him a guy in Ricky Glenn that just got knocked out in the first round by a powerful southpaw. And now they're giving him another southpaw striker that's going to go out there and probably get a first round knockout. So I think Drew Dober is probably going to get the knockout in the first round. I just don't see Ricky Glenn having the capabilities to handle Dober. I mean, maybe he could land one of those slick knees or counter strikes and landed on Dober's chin who's a hittable guy and maybe Dober in this fight we're going to see okay that last fight took his chin away and he's going to get knocked out early by Ricky Glenn but I don't necessarily think that's going to happen I don't think Glenn has the wrestling or the grappling to threaten Drew Dober I know that his wrestling is decent but I think Dober has progressed at this stage of his career to be able to avoid all that from Ricky Glenn and I just don't trust Ricky Glenn to avoid that power shot. I feel like if he gets clipped, he's going to go down. If he did against Yagos, he will against Dober. So I'm going to say Dober gets the first round knockout. And this next fight's a close and competitive fight in the welterweight division. A really fun fight. Alex Morono, he's one of my... I got a weird thing. Like, I like a lot of these mid-card guys that bring it. You know, these action fighters like 
Morono's last fight with Tim Means, that was an awesome matchup for me because I'm a fan of both guys. And I just like Morono's style. I like the way he carries himself. I like uh, the way he fights in the cage. And he always brings the action. You know he's never going to quit on you. And he's always going to fight 100% for your money and fight to his maximum capabilities. And he's taking a guy in uh, Wilkeen Buckley who necessarily maybe you can't say that about him. I mean, he more relies on his athleticism, on his power. He's kind of a glass cannon where if you can connect on him, he hasn't shown the greatest chin. And I feel like he ne- isn't the best at handling adversity or as good at it as Morono is. But stylistically, both guys have great paths to victory. I mean, one thing about Buckley is he has really good kicks and he's going to have the reach and speed advantage in this fight. And I feel like Morono hasn't fought a lot of opponents recently that are southpaws that are kickers I feel like a lot of the guys that he's fought are more hands oriented and I could see Buckley potentially at least early in the fight before Morono gets the range having some success picking at him with kicks and maybe winning minutes that way um and obviously Buckley is going to be looking to pressure in and do his thing where he throws the big wild looping shots and he does a pretty good job where he'll mix in uppercuts. He'll throw some overhands or straight punches and then the big looping strike. So he's kind of trying to go in and around your guard, change the trajectory of where he's throwing and land on you. And sometimes he can land clean and take guys out. But a lot of the guys that he's finished or knocked out have been kind of real lower level guys, non-UFC level guys. The only guy he really finished that I would classify as a pretty good fighter is Kasong and I. Um... For Morono, he more on the feet has great footwork. He has a good jab. He's gotten a lot better pairing and kind of defending strikes, being a little bit more calm. He used to, when guys got in range on him, he'd just start winging bombs to get him out of there. Now he's being a little bit more smart by showing some more defensive tendencies and then getting out of range. He still has that dog in him where he'll sit down and swing, and that's what he's going to kind of need to avoid doing in this fight. He can't let Buckley back him to the fence and then just exchange with Buckley because he doesn't have the power to do that. He has to be the finesse guy in there and use his footwork, use his movement, try to uh, use the jab to catch Buckley coming in, catch him with that check hook or use the overhand. His overhands are really good, like great footwork, great overhands. And if he can land one of those overhands on Buckley, I think Buckley's going get, to get hurt or at least feel it because I don't trust Buckley's chin whatsoever. Um, and if these guys grapple, I think Morono has the edge there. I mean, Morono's... Uh, guillotine he snatched in his last fight with Tim Means was pretty slick man that was pretty nasty and um, I feel like Buckley has the wrestling advantage and could take him down but I think that Morono could get right back up to his feet and or hit a submission on Buckley if he decides to wrestle heavy so I think that a um, sneaky bet is Morono wins via submission but ultimately I think both these guys do have issues in terms of durability if Buckley can land clean on Morono too. I do wonder if Morono could take it. So I think it's a it's a pretty even fight. But I'm going to lean towards the guy that I think is a little tougher and a little bit craftier, a little bit more well-rounded, and that's going to be Alex Morono. So I think Morono is going to be able to find Buckley's chin at one point, either hurt him, make him start shooting takedowns and snatch the neck in a guillotine or some sort of choke, and or finish him with strikes. So... I think Morono's going to win inside the distance on this one. I know a lot of his wins are via decision, but I see him going out there and getting the finish on Wilkeen Buckley at some point. And in the co-main event here, they're still trying to build up Joe Pfeiffer. They're giving him another, in my opinion, fairly easy matchup with him against Abdul Razak Al Hassan. And it's pretty obvious what Pfeiffer has to avoid in this one. He just can't get in a brawl with this guy. Razak, he is older. He's very low volume at this stage in his career and kind of just waits Tries to hope his opponents make a mistake and then land that kill shot. His last fight, he fought a fighter that was very wild, very open to be hit, and ended up catching him and knocking him out. So, Pfeiffer just has to be weary that Razak does have that power, but Pfeiffer has the power too, and I think Pfeiffer's a little bit more technical and throws a lot more numbers. But what I think Pfeiffer could do in this fight to really have an easy matchup, an easy night, is get the takedowns. I think he could take down Razak with ease. I mean, we saw a lot of guys at 185 have been able to just take down Razak fairly easily. I mean, at 170, he might have been a little harder to take down when he was younger. His judo was a little bit more on point. But 
These days, I feel like his takedown defense is lacking quite a bit. And he's not very good on the mat either. I think Pfeiffer, in this in this fight, he can show off his grappling. A lot of the fights previous in the UFC's got in quick knockouts early nights. And that's a, another potential possibility in this fight. But I think he could show, hey, I work with Sean Brady. Hey, I'm training over there with uh, those guys in Philadelphia and getting really good grappling training in. And I can go out there and get a submission win or I can go out there and ground and pound somebody. So I think that Pfeiffer should do that, should go out there, show his grappling and make it an easy night for him against Abdul Razak Al-Assad. If he does that, I think he will have a pretty clean uh, and concise victory and get it done inside the distance. And even if he decides to swing and bang with Razak, I think he'll still probably end up on the right side of that, but it becomes a lot more hairy if he decides to do that. So I'm going to say Pfeiffer wins via submission in the second round. And finally, we got the main event. We got Bobby Green taking on Grant Dawson, kind of new school versus old school kind of matchup, striker versus grappler matchup. So intriguing fight on paper. And I think it's a fight where Bobby Green is getting a little bit disrespected, especially on the money line. I mean, I understand that he did get dominated by Isla Makachev and People are going to assume that Grant Dawson is going to come in here, use his wrestling, and do the same thing to Bobby Green. And we very we, we very well may see that. But I think that people aren't giving Bobby Green enough credit for his other performance against guys that are good grapplers in the past that he's beaten when he's had a longer opportunity to prepare. I think that the fight with Islam got thrown in there on like two weeks' notice after just having a fight. I think he had issues with his hands even going into the fight with Islam and it wasn't his night it wasn't even a close fight he got finished in the first round but I don't think that's gonna happen in this one I mean I think it's gonna be a lot tougher fight for Dawson I think that it's gonna be interesting I mean on the feed I think that Bobby Green is declining unfortunately I don't think he's necessarily exactly where he was a few years ago and when he has that type of style where it's hands down reflexes relying on your speed those guys go down quick, man. I mean, you look at guys like Roy Jones Jr., they're at the top of the world, and then all of a sudden they're getting knocked out by guys that couldn't even sniff their jock strap, you know, three years before that. So Bobby Green has been getting dropped in recent fights. He got dropped against Tony. He got knocked out against Dober. He was getting hit more than I like to see against Jared Gordon. And I think that he, he is kind of slowing down with the striking I think that his chin is kind of deteriorating a little bit too and Dawson is on the other side of the spectrum where his striking is janky and ugly and I think obviously if they do strike and Bobby Green is even semi the level that he was a year ago two years ago he'll light him up but Dawson does have those nice knees up the middle he'll dig in and throw some power punches to get the takedown and if he can land clean on Bobby Green, I wouldn't be shocked to see him drop Bobby Green, knock Bobby Green out. I, I really think that potentially we could see that. We could kind of see the demise of Bobby Green if that happens. But ultimately, you know what Grand Dawson's main objective in the fight is going to be and what Bobby Green's main objective to defend is going to be. And that's going to be Grand Dawson's rest. And if Dawson could take him down, he's shown some of the best back takes and back control in the sport. And... He's probably just going to backpack Bobby Green and either find the finish or just dominate him for 25 minutes. One thing about Bobby Green, I mean, is the guy hasn't been submitted since like 2009. He hasn't gotten submitted in his entire UFC career. So if Grant Dawson can go out there and submit Bobby Green, that'll be a big feather in his cap. I think that's going to be easier said than done. But I could see where Grant Dawson just goes out there and controls him for 25 minutes. There is a little bit of stigma on Grant Dawson in terms of his cardio because you've seen his fight with, uh, even with Nad Naramani back in the day, I remember I thought he slowed down in that one against Ricky Glenn. He clearly slowed down majorly, lost third round 10-8, ended up having to settle for a draw in that fight. So if Bobby Green can extend him and make it tough or eventually get on top of Dawson, that's where Dawson could be in trouble because Green does have good ground and pound. His cardio is going to be on point. And if Dawson gets tired, starts shooting sloppy takedowns, let's Bobby start to get on top of him, I think he'll get finished. But... It's hard to go with Bobby. I mean, he's aging. Like I said, I think he's kind of slipping a little bit. Um, and I think Dawson's on the up and up. So I am going to say Dawson wins via decision, though. I think that Bobby Green is going to show better grappling defense. And I don't think he's going to get just taken out of there with ease. I don't think Grant Dawson has that ground and pound game like Islam to uh, get him out of there with ground and pound that quickly. 
And I don't necessarily know if he's going to be able to find a submission like that. So I'm going to say Grant Dawson wins via decision in this fight. So there you have it, guys. That's the full card breakdown predictions video for UFC Vegas 80. Um, hopefully you, you enjoyed this video. But um, as far as my part of the week goes and my most confident pick, for the part of the week, I'm going to go with a parlay of... Um, man, it's tough this week to find a parlay, but I'll actually give you guys... Just a play of the week. And that play of the week is going to be on Iwan Kute Laba. I think he's going to go out there and get the job done. So that's going to be my play of the week. For my most confident pick, I think Drew Dober is going to get the job done. So give me Drew Dober as my most confident pick. And for the play of the week, like I said, I'm going to go with Iwan Kute Laba. So thanks for watching, guys. Um, hit that like button. Share this video. Put a comment down below. Let's try to get more views on this video. Like I said at the start, I'd really... I want way more than a thousand views, but a thousand views minimum is what I kind of shoot for at the bare minimum. And so I really want that. And uh, yeah, man, besides that, go to patreon.com slash every prediction viewer. This week is a great week to join. I think we're going to do really well and make you guys a lot of money. So definitely urge you guys to go over there this week and make prediction guru or patreon.com slash every prediction guru. Um, besides that, though, guys, thanks for always supporting and I'm out of here.